Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. We're going to start the work session. This work session is Monday, May 29th, 2020. It's for the July 6, 2020 council meeting. Uh, first up on the agenda, on the proposed agenda, is a public hearing, consideration of sale of property locally known as 114 Harrison Avenue, City of Iowa, Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. Mr. Tislin. Are you, are you doing man in the phones today, Jim? Yeah. Is there anybody online now? Okay, thank you. Let me know if someone does. Yeah, but we, just as a work session, we won't have, we don't have anyone to schedule. With no one scheduled, okay, that's what I was wondering, thanks. Okay, Eric, this is a property we acquired from homeowner actually uh, about a month ago um, in a condition that probably would have had to go through the 657A if uh, that weren't the case. Um, does need uh, quite a bit of work. Uh, roof has some repair needs, as you can see in the photos, has some water in it. Uh, it does have a garage. It is a single family property on a smaller lot. Um, is on Harrison, uh, just east of River Street, three houses in there. Um, and we currently have two bids, uh, 500 and 550 for the property um, to purchase for rehab and uh, either rental or single family use. Okay. Looks good, anybody have any questions for Eric on that? Thank you, sir. All right, and next up after that is the public hearing consideration of an ordinance for amending the speed, the section 7304 special speed restrictions of chapter 73 speed regulations of the Burlington Municipal Code first reading. Hi, Nick. How Good are evening. You? Uh, so the reason for this change came initially at the request uh, for the manager of Stone, the Stone Garden Complex. Um, and you can see that the language is in there to reduce the speed limit in that area down to 15 miles per hour. Uh, the traffic flow in that area changed greatly uh, when they installed the fence on Valley Street uh, that butted up against Shields. So traffic flow through the complex is a lot less. Um, it essentially is just the occupants of, of the facility. Um, and then we added on, some, since we're amending the ordinance, uh, the new road installation out at the Recplex area, uh, Hinkle Drive, and then Broadway. Mm -hmm. And so that one is also in there. I can answer any questions on that. We spoke with PD about that. Um, everything seems to make sense on this. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions for Nick on that? No? Is 15 going to be enforceable is what my question is going to be? I don't know that answer. 15? <laughs> Chief's nodding yes. All right, good. That's the way I like it. Thanks. Number, number three, a motion for preliminary adoption of the second reading of an ordinance amending ordinances related to the designating an area of Burlington, Iowa as the Burlington Urban Revitalization Area. Hi, Eric. Uh, no changes from the previous reading. Again, adding the area in the red here um, to bring in a couple extra blocks downtown that would allow um, for those to qualify for the uh, tax expanded tax payment program. Okay. We've been through this a couple times, guys. What do you think about waiving the, the third reading? I did. Okay. All right. We'll ask Kathleen to make that happen. Uh, next up, resolution approving the voluntary severance territory in Lot 1 of Oak Arbor Farm subdivision. Uh, this is a subdivision that was just approved by council. It lies partially in the city and partially in the county. Uh, the dashed uh, line here is the city county line with the city on the east and the county on the west. Um, this kind of shows it here. This is the lot that was created and they are looking to sever the portion on the east side of the city boundary um, to become uh, part of the county. Um, it said land is not serviced by city services, sewer, water, trash, and home is located in the county. Uh, they wish to sell off the home in several acres. Uh, uh, so they want to sever this from uh, city property or city boundaries um, going through the process as outlined in state code but uh, does have to be approved by council and then filed with secretary of state okay any questions for eric on that one gang no thank you eric uh, number five resolution awarding contract for the 2020 seal coat streets project mr mcgregor uh, the resolution here would award contract to W.L. Miller Company uh, for the 2020 seal coat project. 
Um, I had a map up when we went over the plans and specs, but just as a reminder, it includes uh, some of 8th Street, 10th Street, 14th Street, 15th, 16th acres, uh, the end of Harrison uh, that uh, Eric had just ref referenced to, Head Street, and then Jackson Street. We'll also be doing the ADA ramps that cross that, uh, not similar to the way we did the HMA project this last year where we kind of separated them. We plan to do these together. Uh, W.L. Miller was the low bidder at $427,646. Uh, uh, the engineer's estimate was four hundred and eighty, dollars so we're uh, underneath that by quite a bit. The funding source uh, is road use tax uh, for the seal coat program. Um, I would recommend awarding bid. Um, the work sh uh, started relatively quickly the last time they began or be did it, so I would assume by uh, mid-July, by the time contract documentation uh, were to go around, they would start. So. Okay. I can answer any questions. Any questions? Um, the uh, the excess dollars that uh, came in under bid. So those additional dollars, are you going to do additional work? Or? Uh, this is road use tax. Um, we have a little bit of a surplus in the seal coat program. Um, so what we do on the uh, we've been putting doing a transfer of 400000 annually out of road use tax fund into a separate capital fund for specifically for seal coat projects. So he works out of that balance from year to year. And is it, if there's a carryover balance, it just affects what they look for budgeting in next year's project. Okay. okay. So you will do more. It'll just be next year. Yes. Does that affect? Yes. Okay, good. All right, uh, that takes care of the regular agenda on the pr proposed consent agenda. First up is resolution approving nuisance demo and demolition abatements for various properties. Does anybody have any questions on that one? Okay. Number two is a resolution approving amendments to the terms of the Otter Island lease agreement. Who wants to tackle that? Updating the lease agreement. Previously, it was approved for a three-year term uh, with the rates for three, each of the three years. Uh, this would be similar. Uh, the Riverfront Advisory Committee did meet and discuss this as well, and the recommendation is as uh, attached. It's uh, they're recommending a lease rate of $280, uh, which is $5 more than previous for city residents and doing away with the non-city resident uh, fee. Uh, which is a difficult thing uh, to collect and then it just gets people using someone else's address in the city and then trying to track down who actually is the rightful payer uh, makes it hard for our clerk's office so sure uh, just increasing it five dollars for all residents and uh, use out there has been pretty minimal regardless okay. so questions gang i think that's good to eliminate the non-resident mm -hmm. deal uh, next up, resolution approving the purchase of two city light duty buses for the Burlington Urban Service. Uh, the resolution in front of you would approve the purchase of two light duty buses uh, from Thomas Bus Sales um, for the total price of $178,530 or $89,265 per bus. Uh, so we have received two uh, separate FTA or federal grants. Uh, to replace uh, two of our current buses. Um, one of them, and I explained this in my memo, one of them is at an 80% match, mm -hmm. uh, the other one is at 85%. Uh, so it brings our total match to 31,243. Um, so the DOT goes out and does procurement uh, for all the state agencies, uh, all, the, all the local agencies. Um, and Thomas Bus is one that we've used in the past. We've also used Hoagland. There are a couple others. Um, we've had better luck with Thomas, and they already do the procurement process for us. They go through and make sure that they're all ADA compliant, that they meet uh, the standards, um, and that we're able to add things that are necessary for our types of service. Um, you know, whether it be you know a gas motor or diesel motor, um, you know a fare box or you know seat type, wheelchair positioning, things like that. Um, the one thing that I know that. Councilman Mur Councilwoman Murray, you had talked about was bike racks. I did not include that in this pricing um, or in that order. It can be done yet, um, but the question that I, I hesitated on is moving forward with the whole inventory of buses. Um, so to add a bike rack to these two buses would be about 1500 bucks a pop. So relatively cheap. 
Uh, the cost that it, it, where it starts to grow is retrofitting the existing buses to meet that. And I didn't know, uh, I didn't want to put that in here without the council discussing um, what that type of function would be moving forward. So I wanted to address it in conversation, but I did not put that as far as the order. Um, but that's something we're definitely able to talk about now. Where's the rack go? In front of the bus. In front of the bus. I mean, I, I would say, and this is my opinion, but moving forward, it probably makes sense for that price just to go ahead and add them. I'm not, I don't think it's necessary to go back and procure, to attach a bike, bike rack to all of the existing buses. Just do it as we move forward, and eventually you'll end up with a fleet that has them. I think when Tiger comes through and we have a lot of young people residing downtown, I think that will be seen as a, a positive for our community. I, I see no need to retrofit the other ones at a tremendous cost, but I think starting with one or two might be a good start and to see how the usage is. We do have that awkward phase where we have two buses that have it and then the rest that don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yeah, that. We ha There's also concern in my book from the medium duty buses that are a little bit longer uh, whether or not they'll fit in the bus bays. Uh, I haven't measured that out because I don't want to know how long the, the bike racks are. But well, if, if it's something that you wish me to add to this, we more than certainly can. It's not it's nominal dollars in the purchase of the bus, but I, I guess I want to well, see from the council whether or not that's something So is your concern that somebody would use a bike rack to get to one point and then they would expect to have that same service going back? Yes. So let me ask you this. And it may not occur that way is because it, is of the a, way the bus is. A bus is typically doing a loop, correct? No, and you also have the transport points. So if I get picked up in South Hill and want to go out to the hospital or something or, where, or wherever, you may have a transfer at the depot, and that bus transfer will not necessarily – if you have two buses, it will be more than likely you won't have that bus have a bike rack on it. Um, in my opinion, I think that you should move forward with a system that has bike racks across the board for consistency. Um, but I understand your point as far as retrofitting. We so are we are purchasing, or we will have the ability to purchase um, money from the CARES Act for a bunch of new buses. I wouldn't like to buy those all at the same time, because we get into the problem that we have right now. We have the the Era Act buses, mm -hmm. which came through the Obama stimulus package. We have them all kind of seeing their end of life all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's something I want to try and avoid, at least stagger them out so we can plan for it better. Um, <clears throat> I, so I, think, I think a retrofit would probably be about 5000 Mostly it's the labor. Per bus? Per bus. Yeah, that's kind of I think you just do the two for now, and there's going to be growing pains moving forward, but we'll just have to work through them, especially if we've got dollars coming in and we're going to be replacing the fleet over the next couple of years anyways. How long for you replacing other buses? Got any idea? I have, a, I have another medium duty bus that probably will be coming to you in the next month or two. Okay. Um, but then I don't know about the CARES funding source. Okay. The DOT still has not sorted out so how what many, that means. How many buses do we have in the fleet right now? We have now? 14 total buses in the fleet. So if you're coming to us in another month, we'd be doing three buses. And then we did two last year, right? Correct. So those do uh, not have bike racks on them. Though. They don't. And. If we were to go ahead and have bike racks and solve them, though, because I'm assuming that those would be, I mean, you're 10 years out from replacing them, correct? I, Probably. Yeah. So if we went ahead and had you install them on those two buses because they're, they're the most recently purchased, you install them on the two in this order and then on the one on the next one, we would have, put, we would have five buses that have bike racks, and then we would just continue that trend. That would lessen the growing pains. I would assume, right? I just don't want to. It brings get, up your probability of I just having don't a have bus a with them. Sixty thousand dollar bill to put bike racks on. No. Well, for for me, what we're here, what we're here to this would be to prove the the, the purchase. bus purchase. Now, what I guess I before I would say let's install racks. I would much rather have you make sure it's going to fit in the bus space. And these will because they're light duty. Those, they're, those they're a lot shorter. So it's the medium duty you're concerned about. Correct. And the, the one that we just replaced? Uh, red? We had two medium duties that we okay. just replaced. Um, I'm sure we could probably get the specifications to see if it would fit or not. Yeah, I would. The, the only thing that I worry about 
jumping into the bike rack thing is mm -hmm. some of the operational concerns that it takes. It already takes us a significant amount of time to get a, people on the bus sometimes and loading a bike up then becomes our liability if a bike is not, we have to make sure that it's probably secured. It's secured, get in a car accident. There's just things that I don't know about in operating a bus system with bikes on it now to jump it into it. And if we're gonna do it, I guess I would rather jump into it and have all the fleet be ready for it. And then how many bikes will it hold? Is it just one two? Or two? I'm sure there's extenders that could be more than that. What, what are we doing right now about people? Are we just not servicing them? They typically ride their bike. You know what I mean? Like, I hate to say it like that. I don't mean it to be rude, but they don't get on the bus system to ride their bike to somewhere else. Right. Well, where I'm at on it would be, I think it's a good idea for us to look at it and to investigate it, but I don't want to do it fl fly by the seat of our pants. So. Well, but he needs to know if we're going to add bike wraps to these two. I, I understand, but if it's only 1500 we can add those afterwards. We we're putting the labor, though. And if afterwards. I would do it, I would do it upon the yeah. order. Yeah. So I would have to change the pricing and the dollar figure that well, I'm going to send off to Thomas it, with, be with this council. 5000 per bike if we do it later, or 1500 now if we do it in the order. That's what it's I think we should do it now. I mean, it's kind of like an, it's not like um, it's the, an Ironman. you got to dip your toe in the water. <laughs> so I, I say go ahead and try it on these two. If it fails miserably and it, it, logistically it doesn't work, people don't use it, then maybe we back off and we don't equip the other fleet. But we try it and see what the response is maybe. Questions? I, well, first of all, I'd like to know if the medium duty, if it's even feasible. Because if it's not feasible, and you're saying you want to do all of them or none of them, and at the medium duty we can't do them, then are we putting them on the new ones for no apparent reason? Uh, secondly, I agree with Linda. I think we should, you know, if we're going to do it, let's get them on the, the two new ones now and try it. But until we know if there is even a fit in the best garage, I'm kind of, I don't want to waste the money. So normally on buses, Nick, we're doing light duty, but sometimes we're doing mediums. We or have, or we, we have about, about a 60, 40 split. Okay. We have about six medium duty buses and the rest are light duties. Okay. So if the end goal is to eventually end up with them all have buses on, the bike racks on them. We need to really know about the medium buses. Will they fit? If you have a bike rack on. And I'll bring that back to you. I Okay. I was a little ill prepared. I shouldn't have brought it in. I shouldn't have introduced the topic the way I did. That's all right. And I realize that, but I know that when we are talking about purchasing buses, that that's the time to do it if you're going to have that conversation. If we can make um, it fit. But I don't, I, on one, I didn't know where our council stood on having them on there. Um, but I will go back and I'll measure. This can be probably moved to the regular agenda then, so you guys can discuss it next week. Yeah. Um, I will measure and make sure what the dimensions are. Yeah, I mean, because for me, as we go forward, you know, if we, if, if that's that's what we're telling the, the Tiger Grant, you know, is we're we're trying to be more walk and and bicycling, and that's the the push. I'm all for that if they're going to fit on medium duty buses. But if they're not going to fit on the medium duty buses in the current building we have then I'm really leery about putting them on the light duty buses on, because then it does make a problem for you as far as scheduling and that type of thing. So if you could find that out, uh, I think that would be, that would help make a decision there. It definitely should be put on at the time you order because it's cheaper. Um, and if that's the end goal, that's fine. But I, I really don't want to move forward if, if it's not going to fit. So does that make sense? Yep. Is everybody happy with that? All right, so if you could do that, and we'll put it on that well. the other. Uh, next up, I believe this is Eric. Resolution approving the lease of two Toro Greenmaster 3150 green mowers, greens mowers by Flint Hills Golf Course for four years. This is something we've historically done every four years for our greens mowers. They're the only piece of equipment that we do lease. We buy the rest, uh, one being their probably the most critical piece of equipment for the quality of play at the course is the greens. And we want to make sure we have warranty and have good product uh, continually. Uh, we do have this budgeted in, in our operational budget as we have in the past. Um, we had 18,000 budgeted. The uh, uh, payment is uh, 17,196 annually over four years. Okay. And because they're leased, we have to do it. Yep. Okay. 
Any questions, guys? Of course, it looks beautiful. It does. Yeah, they've it's been probably the best it's ever been that I've ever witnessed. It. Very w actually doing fairly well this year. So. I missed an easy putt on six. Let's yeah. look at that. Let's see what's going on. Okay, that's probably skill related. That's definitely user. All right, let's get off my golf game. Uh, <laughs> resolution approving professional services agreement with HR Green Inc. of Cedar Rapids, Iowa for general consulting services for the Burlington, Iowa wastewater treatment facility for a period of July 1st, 2020 to June 1st, 2021. Hi, Don. Howdy. Um, this would be basically renewing what we've done for the last uh, three years, okay. um, giving us um, an uh, agreement with uh, an engineering firm that we are very familiar with and who are very familiar with our plant uh, and enable us to engage them for small projects, various sizes. Um, they can do the work for us and they bill us time and materials typically is what they do. And then okay. we pay them out of this agreement. This agreement is for $20,000. Uh, typically, I've done a $10,000 agreement. Earlier this calendar year, I came forward forward and asked for a $5,000 amendment to allow us to go above the 10000 that we had with the original. This one has that same requirement. If we were to go above the $20,000, we would come back for the amendment. I don't see that happening, but we do have a number of projects that we're looking at that we would more than likely utilize them for. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that? And it is, I do have the money already in the budget to cover Even it. Even better. Yeah. All right. I think that's good with us. Uh, next up is resolution approving a purchase of two trailer mounted six inch trash pumps. We have uh, two trailer mounted uh, trash pumps. They're driven by uh, six cylinder gasoline engines. They date back to 1981, 1982. Um, we use them when we're draining process tanks. Um, they serve as backups to, we have an MPDS permit that requires us to treat up to a maximum flow rate. Um, when we take certain tanks off of line, um, it also takes dedicated pumps, process pumps out of the picture during the time that that tank is down for repairs and for maintenance. Uh, we utilize these pumps that we have, these trailer mounted pumps, to supplement or replace the lost pumps that are out of service while we have the tanks down. Uh, these pumps were also are also used um, as an emergency pump to our Silver Street lift station, which is located east of Case Corporation. Um, that's a long, long uh, force main it has a very high head requirement to get the water from there down to uh, the Market Street lift station and these two trailer mounted pumps are designed to handle that head and get the water there if we have to use them in that application. Uh, we have the gasoline, these will be diesel. Um, when we do use those pumps, oftentimes it's during a rainstorm when we have a processed tank down and the dedicated pumps that go with that tank are out of, not available. These pumps are used to handle that extra water. The motors, the engines, the mufflers get very, very hot and when you're dealing with gasoline around very hot engines, it can get kind of scary. Um, these diesel engines will provide a, an increased level of safety in handling that water. <clears throat> Probably some fuel efficiency and maybe a longer life too, wouldn't it? Because normally, I, because I would of the heat and wear it. Tear, yeah. Yes, I would anticipate okay. that. Yes. And those were in your budget too? Yes. Okay. There, it's a CIP item. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any questions on that for Don? CIP was uh, 90000 and the quote that came in was at eighty five five basically. I did see there was a quote in there for sixty eight. We had a set of pumps that were uh, bid that did not meet the specifications with regards to the way the um, self prime and we felt that this was the best way to go as to this style pump with a priming system okay so what do you do with the old ones don 
Uh, we haven't really decided if we're going to try to sell them on Purple Wave or how we'll handle them. Try to get the best deal we can. Make any sense to sit on them? Maybe. If you can't get a good price for them. We uh, try to exercise our pumps, all our pumps, regardless of size, uh, make sure that they're functioning properly. Okay. Um, how mobile are they? Well, it's a fairly large trailer. Um, I mean, you have to have a good size pickup truck to hook to and drag them around. It's, a, it's like I say, it's a six cylinder, straight six cylinder Ford engine on the pump. It's a pretty heavy pump. I don't know, I would think so. Huh. Okay, I don't have any questions. Do you? Do you? Do you? Sounds good. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Don. Uh, and then we're going to set some dates for public hearings, July 20, 2020. I'm so tired of 20s. Consideration of plans and specifications for the 2020 flood mitigation phase six and a consideration of sale of properly locally known as 232 South 6th Street, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. And finally, a consideration of a permanent encroachment agreement with McConnell Lofts LLC for encroachment into the fourth North 4th Street right away adjacent to 206 and 208 North 4th Street, Burlington, Iowa. Uh, next up is Treasurer's Report. Hi, Stephanie. We'll be quick. Um, May, there was really nothing out of the ordinary. Um, we'll start to make transfers in June, and some of the fund balances that will be in the negative will, will change. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything that, um, you know, we're working away with our grants. Um, I know our FEMA fund will end the year with a negative. We won't have the projects obligated and be getting money um, by the time we close the books um, in the next couple months. So our year end is tomorrow. Um, so then you'll, you know, we'll finish up the books, but then they, they stay open for a couple of months till we get everything recorded back that we need to. So, but it's always happy new year for us <laughs> <laughs> closing the books out. So does anybody have any questions or nope. Jim, did you have something to add? Just note, and I've probably said it on some of them already uh like recplex is sitting with a uh, hundred so a hundred thousand i can't remember what the figures are without having them up uh golf course is forty six thousand in a hole um she mentioned the uh flood fund is right now it's sitting at seven hundred thousand we still have both fema and insurance reimbursements to come up but that's a significant number and we don't really know where that's going to whether that's going to zero out or not uh, until we get farther through this process. Hopefully we do. Um, property maintenance, vehicle maintenance are both sitting uh, with uh, significant deficits that we'll still have to allocate back to the different departments. So those will get zeroed out. Um, it seems like there should have been one other one that I wanted to note of, of a deficit. So Tiger Grant has actually with that's all, but that's all going to be reimbursed. It's uh, timing. The projects don't bother me as much outside of the would note on the flood uh, project. It has a significant cash balance in there, uh, 400, 4 million in one, one account, which, which we borrowed mm -hmm. specifically for the project that we just set the public hearing for. Uh, there's like 400,000, I think in the other uh, account. If you were to notice in that account, the revenues for this year are like 360 or 380,000, something like that. It's supposed to be 700,000, and we were on pace to get that uh, until everything shut down. Mm -hmm. And we're now on pace to get exactly what we have in that account. Uh, next year, we were supposed to get 800,000 in there, and we're likely to get none. Um, so I just want to note that we have some headwinds in there. Uh, most of the deficits that we have, I mentioned the, with the recplex and golf course specifically, those will get zeroed out, but they'll come out of hotel, motel, uh, whatever it takes to zero them out. Um, golf course, the golf has actually done fairly well, and yet it's probably going to be a $55,000 transfer year end. It may be a tad less that we need to do out of hotel, motel. Uh, Recplex is likely to be about 100, my guess is 140 to maybe a little bit higher than that, depending on how June does. 
Uh, so those, and that is, you know, we originally budgeted in there 110,000. So we're behind this year, and that is specifically because of COVID. Yeah. And if you have any other questions. Thanks for the inspiration. I tried. Uh, anybody need a moment to recover? No, no, no. <laughs> we'll just move on. All right, next up we have the, the gentleman from Impact 7G, uh, Mike Fisher and Brandon Scott. They're going to make a little presentation. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. I was supposed to be here March 9th. I think I might have had COVID. I don't know. I was sick for three weeks, but no one could test me back then. So, <laughs> so we don't know what it was. <laughs> so I apologize for not being here March 9th and putting this in front of you then. Um, but we're getting to it now. So, um, okay. um, so what we want to do is talk a little bit about the work that we did related to the Cascade Bridge. Um, some of you may have been at the last outreach session that we held for the general public, which was very well attended. Mayor, I know you were there. Um, very well attended. A um, lot of good input, um, but really resulted in the need to get more input, <laughs> more decisive input, if I don't put it that way. So um, we kind of we expanded our scope to do actually a formal survey. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But um, let me start out, um, introduce Brandon. Brandon is our cultural resource expert, um, deals with both historic properties as well as archaeological sites um, all around the state, um, and was a, a big asset to this project because he presents um, knowledge and understanding of, this, of the structure and the significance and how Iowa treats historic structures uh, that proved valuable for the project. We've got a large agenda on this presentation. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things I want to at least mention a key point on. Um, obviously, we can't go into the level of detail on each of these items that, that I'd like, but there is a report. Hopefully, you all um, have that as well, a draft report, that is. Hopefully, you all have that as well that discusses all these items in more depth. Um, my point tonight is to basically give you some um, key information that I think is valuable to decision making for the city. So um, the objective of, of, of this study, it was not an engineering study. It was not to evaluate the uh, status of the um, trusses on the bridge as to whether or not they'll hold up. The objective of this study was to gather information to help determine a proposed, keyword proposed future for the existing bridge structure and or crossing. So we're dealing with a National Register structure here, but we're also dealing with the need to cross uh, ravine in terms of an impediment to connectivity here in Burlington. So. The objective of this study was to obtain public input, stakeholder input, city staff input, um, includes engineering staff, parks and rec staff input. Um, look at you know the overall city prioritization of infrastructure projects. You know what's the status here in Burlington with other projects? How does this project factor in? Why are we repairing Mount Pleasant Bridge and we're not repairing Cascade Bridge? Um, and some of this may seem um, basic information to those of us that work in and around close to the city, but for the general public, it may not be so apparent. Um, and so the idea was to get information out there. Um, it, the objective was also to look at um, what funding would it take um, to implement demolition um, or to implement other future alternatives that could include um, you know, restoring the structure. Um, to look at cultural considerations, to get the SHPO aware that we are at least looking at this, 
So we did some informal uh, SHPO involvement at this point. Um, and the objective of this study was also to help the city get a handle around the purpose and need for what might be proposed in the future. So what would be the pur purpose of a future action and what would be the need for that future action? Critical points to decision making. And looking at alternatives, mind you. Um, so this, we had a number of tasks. Um, what you're looking at to the right in that picture, just a little anecdotal information, is, is the historical uh, Gantt chart uh, of when they were um, building the bridge. Obviously no computers back then, but uh, kind, of, kind of interesting to go back and look at some of the historic data. We did um, <coughs> pillage uh, Jesse's files over in engineering to see what information we could find. Um, and, and, you know, there was some interesting uh, historical information on some of, of how the bridge was built, the cost, and, and different studies that were done as well. So we did try to get a good grasp of the, the long history of Cascade Bridge. Um, so our, our tasks were uh, to develop a project website to make sure that was accessible and out to the public, to allow them a chance to provide comment through that website, review past inspections, evaluations, and studies, uh, provide uh, information to our State Historic Preservation Officer Office, I should say, um, meet with stakeholders, um, and that would include the Historic Preservation Commission as well, so um, as one of those meetings. We were tasked to hold a public listening session and to finally compile all the community's input so to, to give you an idea, a better understanding of what the community um, perspective is on this bridge and the crossing. So and that's what we're here today for, for to provide you some of that input. Um, little, very quick history, 1896, it was com the bridge was completed at a cost of $16,000. If you run those numbers, uh, to um, $2019 amounts to about almost about $490,000. They were, they were pretty efficient back then, <laughs> uh, it would seem. <laughs> um, listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1998, closed to vehicle traffic in 2008. So 10 years later, we closed it to vehicle traffic um, due to its poor critical condition. Um, and that condition was determined from formal engineering analysis of the structure. Closed to foot traffic in 2019. Um, obviously, as you can see from the numbers, well over a century of use in this community. During that century of use, there was substantive repairs to the structure over time. Um, it was, uh, these are the dates that I have up there are, are dates where we had major kind of more major repairs on the structure, all, dating all the way back to you know, about 50 years after it was built roughly, um, all the way up until uh, 1998, it appears to be the last year of, of any kind of major repairs. Um, that included replacing the original deck. The original deck on this bridge was wooden. Um, and so it was replaced with a, um, a, a graded deck, if you will, in 1964. Um, so if you've been across the bridge, you can see that it's not a solid duck. Water, um, de-icing chemicals, and et cetera, have the ability to go from above to below to the rest of the structure. This bridge is unique. It has its supporting structure beneath it versus above it. Um, and so unfortunately, that supporting structure beneath it uh, bore the brunt of some of the maintenance. It, um, during our harsher winter months. These are some of the past engineering evaluations that we looked at uh, fairly closely, 2006 inspection, 2008 inspection, um, and looked in, in a lot of depth at the Shuck Britson report, which was a rehabilitation evaluation. Specifically, they were tasked to evaluate what it would take to rehabilitate this bridge. What would that cost be um, versus, say, a potential new structure and provide that information to council at the time? Um, their study was actually based on, they did, went out and did site observations, they took photos, they validated condition, but um, much of their information was based on the 2008 hands-on bridge inspection, formal bridge inspection. 
So the Shuck Britson study too was completed by Iowa um, Bridge engineer. Um, in my opinion, having worked for an engineering company for 15 years, it was a fairly well done study. So based on the scope that they were presented. Um, part of what we did um, to benefit your decision making was to provide a range of alternatives for consideration. These were also presented to the public via the survey um, and introduced to the public via the website. So there's a range of alternatives there. There's a, there is a mistake on here, correct, Brandon? Do you see it? Okay, there is a mistake in the, in the second column, it says vehicle, all the way on the bottom, uh, the, or, I'm sorry, the third to the last row, it says do nothing, build parallel bridge, and there's an X there. There shouldn't be an X there. I apologize for that. Um, so what we have here is key alternatives. These alternatives include actually um, doing nothing, which... Um, and building par parallel bridge, um, but also includes removing the bridge and then not taking any further action. We did not put the alternative on here of simply not removing the bridge and not doing anything else. And the reason we didn't is because um, I think for the purpose of the council's decision making on a proposed future course of action here, we need to consider the fact that if we do nothing, absolutely nothing, someday that bridge will fall down. Um, or there will be a liability attached to it in the meantime if a car goes across it or a Jeep, you know? So, um, so what we have here is a range of alternatives. We, we took cost based on the studies that, that we had um, and information we had from engineers and gave those cost in a range. It is very hard these days to come up with a definitive cost without a final, sets, a final set of design plans and specifications. So we gave that a range. Um, these are ranges that, that are um, based on also similar examples. Um, and what's key, what I'm gonna point out here, what's key to understand is this bridge can be rehabilitated. It will likely cost more money to do that than build new based on the data that we analyzed. That's the bottom line. But it can be rehabilitated. This historic structure can be saved. Um, there will be limitations to that. Limitations in terms of its life. Limitations in terms of its, um, the load restrictions on that bridge. Um, possibly um, more maintenance dollars in the future if, if it's rehabilitated than say a new bridge. But, um, it is possible. And I'm not going to, I don't want to go into to all the details here, but, I, but I, I just wanted to make that point as well as um, the, the option that we did include here was a, leaving the bridge in place. That assumes that there would be some minimal work to keep it from falling down. If it was left in place and we built a parallel structure. If you build a parallel structure, there will be some slight right away of needs for that structure. So um, that means you know, acquiring maybe a portion of someone's yard to be able to access the parallel structure because it won't be a straight shot off of Main Street. So, um, but um, again, some cost considerations for you to consider here. Um, I, I, I'm gonna stay on this slide and, and take any questions now on this slide, just if anyone has any questions as to something, I mean, related to these alternatives. Jim, you have something? I just want to point out something, uh, Matt. How many uh, fire pieces of, piece of the fire equipment would be able to go across this bridge with these weight restrictions? You want to answer that question? 20, 20 tons. 20 tons. Uh, only the ambulances. Only the ambulances. None of, none of the fire apparatus can go across the bridge with that, with, if, that, if it truly ends up at a 20 ton weight restriction. So just want to make sure you understand that with those considerations. Okay. 
so the the point it, the point being is that the engineering studies concluded that we wouldn't be able to rehabilitate this to a to an open open limit in terms of the loads that might cross it doesn't have that capacity based on its design so um, the um, the other typo in there, I think, that Brandon just pointed out was, I, and, I'll, and I'll get some new tables out to everyone on this, but in, in the revised report, um, but the load limit on uh, replace with new bridge should be uh, different as well. Um, meaning if we put a new bridge in, we're, we're, gonna, we're not gonna have a load limit on it, okay? If we do a new parallel bridge, it's not gonna have a load limit. The actual um, new bridge, if it's just a pedestrian bridge, it will be designed to um, accommodate a vehicle for maintenance in terms of load limit, okay? So you'll have to be able to get a vehicle across it, to heavy, a heavier vehicle to maintain. So that'll have some load limitation on it, but it'll be pedestrian anyway, so, um, as opposed to vehicles. Um, estimated upfront capital expenditure, again, coming from Chuck Britson, rehab, Six point, roughly six point seven million, replacement four point one million. That does not include um, engineering, design, construction, observation fees, um, and if and if we replace it, we've also got to include demo in there, dem demolition costs. Um, so, um, they also performed a net present cost analysis in that study. And again, I'm not going to go into the details in in here, but the net present cost. Um, was significantly higher. Keep in mind that this report was done in 2012 too. Things changed, steel prices changed, construction changed, labor changes. Um, so it was a 2012 report. But it gives you some order of magnitude um, idea of the difference in cost here as to what we're looking at. Um, the design fee, if you're familiar, I mean you guys have done enough work as, as council approving engineering budgets and so forth, but we're looking at eight to 12% of rehabilitation construction cost um, with construction observation between four and 10% depending on what you contract for for observation during construction. So you've got fees on top of here. They're fairly significant on top of these dollar amounts. Um, so um, based on the Mount Pleasant Bridge example, expected design and inspection fee to be in the 15% range uh, of the upfront capital expenditure. So what was, what, where did Mount Pleasant end up? How do they compare? It was a 500 foot long bridge, Cascade was 450. Um, it, the new bridge at Mount Pleasant consisted of concrete piers, beams, deck, um, that may not work at Cascade because we've got a 200 foot span based on the current um, peer placement. Um, so whether or not we can do that on this bridge or not, but assuming it's similar to M Mount Pleasant, um, Mount Pleasant had design and construction inspection, design and construction inspection cost of 700,000. Um, and this was just completed when, Nick, last, last year about? Summer. Okay. Um, Total cost, bottom line, $5 million at, for a 500 foot bridge. So we're looking at significant, significant money here for uh, infrastructure. Um, other cost factors of potential cascade bridge replacement, you've got historical mitigation cost. So uh, there's a potential for mitigating the impacts to a national register of structure, especially if you're using federal dollars. And we go through what's called the section 106 process with the state historic preservation office. We will, con if you have federal dollars, we'll be obliged to consult with them. They will make recommendations for what they consider acceptable mitigation if we eliminate this national register structure, okay? so. Um, could be additional costs there. The desire by the community to incorporate aesthetic or unique features could add additional costs beyond Mount Pleasant, um, additional width, width of the structure for pedestrian use, um, or other environmental planning costs. If you replace a 
put a bridge here and you have federal dollars, um, there'll be other environmental planning and investing in impact analysis cost. So we, we we're giving this for comparison to, to try to establish some, you know, credibility to these price ranges, if you will. Um, bridge re rehab. What's an example bridge that, that's been done in Iowa? Well, there was a Ra Waverly, Iowa green bridge, smaller, um, but you can see it had si similar decking on it. Uh, the, su the support structure was up above versus below. Uh, that bridge to rehab it was 2.4 million. And they went through a similar process that Burlington's gone through on the bridge in terms of looking at alternatives. They looked at it, changing it just to just a bike pedestrian bridge. Um, they looked at a new bridge, they looked at a parallel bridge, many of the same things. So, but this bridge was 2.4 million. If you scale it to the size of the Cascade Bridge, we're looking at about 6.7 million. So, um, did I skip a slide? Um, you know, with this bridge, there's, you know, we wanted to give some consideration to what are, what are the economic, and, and, we, and this is, deserves consideration in part two because the public believes there, there's some economic considerations that need to be taken here, um, and there are. Um, the question is, to what degree, how do they play into the decision-making process? Um, let's look at vehicles per day in 2006 on this bridge, which was the the most recent data we had um, before it closed uh, to vehicle traffic. So it had 1,374 vehicles. Mount Pleasant, four to 5,000 vehicles per day. So you can see when it comes to prioritization, why a bridge a crossing at Mount Pleasant might get greater prioritization in terms of being funded for, for being uh, repaired or replaced. Um, Low use for vehicle traffic prior to closure. Crossing was part, was part of the Great River Road prior to the bridge being closed. And this point was brought up at several meetings. Park remains accessible, though, on alternative Great River Road routes. So the Great River Road routes still exist. It isn't the same as it was through the park. It goes around the park. But, and you can still access the parks on that Great River Road route. The bridge itself <clears throat> um, has never that we could find has been highlighted as a destination on Great River Road tour guides. So um, the, the role of Great River Road and bringing people to Burlington and that connection of that economically is, is, is a little weak. We, we couldn't find evidence of that. I, I think it could. I think maybe some people do travel the Great River Road and they would want to see that bridge. I'm not denying that fact. I'm just saying there's not a huge amount of economic activity that we could um, derive from what is out there on the connection between the bridge and Great River Road. Um, <clears throat> few businesses are bypassed by the current Great River Road route. Um, there, there is a business for sure that is bypassed by the current route that was on the Great River Road route before the bridge closed. And that individual was at one of the smaller meetings we held to get information out to the public. So his business might be affected some. It can affect businesses if the route changes of tourists coming through your town. Um, on the other hand, additional businesses might receive that traffic. So, um, like the brewery. So, um, so teasing out retail sales associated with tur tourism, particularly as it re relates to Great River Road tourism, um, much less Cascade Bridge, is, it was almost impossible because there's just no data to tease it out. There's no data out there to do that kind of analysis. So, so some, um, you know, we wanted to present that. Um, we hear a lot of hearsay surrounding Great River Road and the economic impact. I can't validate any of that. It's anecdotal for, mm -hmm. for the purpose of decision making. Um, so the 2004 Mississippi River or Mississippi Parkway Commission statewide survey does point that visitors consider historical sites and or museums museums as a fourth leading factor influ influencing their decision to take the Great River Road. Meaning if someone's going to decide, hey, we're going to travel the Great River Road through three states, what are we going to see? 
museums, historical sites, rank up there. So they might be coming to see this bridge as it is unique. Um, not going to spend much time on this other than the fact that um, there's a lot of items that are going on here in Burlington and a lot of infrastructure that needs to be maintained over the years. Um, this bridge is both in terms of rehabil rehabilitation and or rebuilding it is competing with a lot of other high priority projects, as you know, <laughs> um, and, and funding. So um, we've got general, general obligation bond demand for sewer, stormwater, major bridge road repairs, other infrastructure, flood wall. Um, we've just got a lot of items that are competing and I think that in, from what I can tell in part that has contributed to the fact that this hasn't been elevated in terms of prioritization for rehabilitation or replacement. Um, in addition, I think since over the last 10 years, there's been a significant improvement here in Burlington of the tax levy rate, the consolidated tax burden. There has been, the data shows there has been a significant improvement. Um, the 2020 data shows a rank of number 14 in terms of consolidated tax rate in Iowa cities with population over, population over 25,000. Um, so um, what I'm going, the point being there for the purposes to understand um, are we one of the most highly taxed communities, cons consolidated tax base in, in the state? No, we're not. Uh, for communities that might be similar in size or bigger than us, we're not. Um, Burlington's come a long way in terms of improving that number. Um, if you look at the past data, uh, the rank was, was higher. <laughs> so. Um, just, just real quick, some of the outreach efforts that we did, we presented the Kiwanis, the Rotary, uh, Greater Burlington Partnership Young Leadership Group, um, general public at the community-wide listening session, the Historic Preservation Commission, um, Greater Burlington business leaders, developed the website. Um, uh, we had pushes going out on the community Facebook page and directed people to the website where they could actually get their hands on this information and they could get their hands on some of the presentations that were done. So if they wanted to provide input directly to any of you, they could, um, or to city leader, other city leaders. So there was a quite a bit of outreach effort. What we found is throughout all this outreach, we were trying to get input. <laughs> what we found is we didn't get a whole lot of input um, you know, from, from these groups. And they were interested, they were intrigued, they, were, they learned more about the city's process, et cetera, but we didn't get a lot of input. This was some of the input we got initially from the, from the uh, website. The website had a place where you could get on and leave a message, um, leave a comment. And this was some of the information. It, it varied. It was all, really all over the place. Um, a lot of the people wanted to see it re reopened, at least to pedestrian. People wanted to be able to access that park, walk to the park, ride their bike to the park, et cetera. Um, but bottom line is we couldn't develop anything definitive from the amount of input we were getting via this process. So we took it another step further and did a formal survey. Um, and with that, I'm going to let Brandon talk a little bit about that process. Hi. So yeah, we did a bunch of uh, public meetings, went to a bunch of groups, listened to everybody that had comments, took copious amounts of notes through those. Uh, the public meeting was actually pretty well attended considering how public meetings often go. I think we had 80 plus people crammed into the library, which is uh, pretty impressive for a bridge. But we only got 51 responses from that, uh, you know, questionnaire responses from that listening session. So when we went to an online tool, we saw a significant increase in, in participation. Um, so of the responses we had 633 people that we could identify as residents we asked a uh, residency question to provide an address uh, whether people gave us a real one or not i can't tell you but 633 people claim to be from burlington um, and that's what we'll present on these slides um, the people of burlington that participated 
they, they believe that this bridge should, is an important part of the city's infrastructure and it should be prioritized. Um, they also said that they use the bridge all the time or would use the bridge all the time to a rate that doesn't match the historic traffic data, but um, I guess that's not surprising. People usually overvalue that sort of thing. When it came to the importance of a crossing type, People really don't like the notion of, of having no crossing of that ravine at all. Um, they were very unsupportive of just taking the bridge down and not letting anybody go across it that way. When it came to a pedestrian crossing, um, they thought it was important to have pedestrians, and they also thought it was very important that pedestrians and vehicles be able to cross there to the park. Um, a fun thing was asking about the taxing questions because when you bring up taxes, people get a little, a little more involved in, in, in thinking about it or, um, you know, how they interpret how their dollars are being spent. Um, they're pretty split on whether or not you should use tax funds or increase taxes for reuse or preservation of the bridge. Um, they don't really support only a pedestrian crossing with an increase in tax dollars. So if you went for just a pedestrian bridge across it, um, you wouldn't see as much support as you would see for a mixed pedestrian and vehicle bridge, which they were pretty well supportive of um, on how tax dollars could be raised and spent. These are kind of two graphs that contradict each other. Um, when we asked about how important is historic preservation of the bridge to you, people were pretty, pretty split on whether or not they thought historic preservation was important. So they do care about the bridge and the history that it brings. But when you ask about what would you like to see, a rehabilitated bridge, a new bridge, or a different option, overwhelmingly people thought they should see a new bridge when given those three alternatives. Um, so it seems like, you know, the need, the cost, and the use life were more of a determining factor on their opinion making than the history itself. And when we gave all of the alternatives, it became quite clear that everybody kind of, or a lot of people really wanted uh, to remove the bridge and replace it with a new one um, by a large, large scale. Um, this particular question they can answer more than once. Um, maybe some of you also took the survey and answered, but you could pick as many of those as you wanted to. Um, so that's, that's how that came out, and that's why there's more responses than, than uh, surveys were returned. We had places where you could type, and people definitely typed. Um, I supplied those uh, responses to Nick and Jesse today so they could distribute them over to you if you felt like reading them. Um, so we did a little bit of word cloud because what people, checking a box is often a little biased and sometimes people like to explain themselves a little better or, or come up with different options um, or have a different mode of, of speaking about it. But what was clear from, from the written response data was that People were concerned about the parks and the access to the parks and the cost of getting to the park. Um, other things kind of took, took a side. When it came to, even when it came to people seeking rehabilitation, the purpose for rehabilitation more often than not was a description of how they could access the park or how it influenced the park or what it brought people to the park, tourism to the park. Um, so that was a main focus of most of the comments. And one where uh, my colleague Mike Fisher was described as a snake oil salesman. That was a that was a fun one too. So there are some historic preservation laws that you need to be aware of. Um, the first one is Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. So if you take federal funding um, or you need a federal permit, something involving the federal government, you have to consider your effect to historic properties. And we already know the bridge is a historic property. So in order to work through the process, you would have to consult with a federal agency. It might be the DOT, for instance. 
um, and the State Historic Preservation Office to figure out how you can reduce the effect, mitigate the effect, or have no adverse effect to the, uh, to the property at all. And an adverse effect could be significant rehabilitation, like if you start tearing apart that bridge and replacing it with all new parts just to make it look the same, that would still be an adverse effect to the history of that property because you're replacing so many materials. Demolition and replacement is obviously an adverse effect. Um, and it can be kind of a lengthy process. You have to come up with agreements and implement steps and stuff with the, with the preservation office. A much more complex one is involved with DOT funding, and that's uh, Section 4F. Um, if you select DOT funding, you would have to run through this lengthy and complicated process. Um, it's going to prohibit you that you use a 4F property, which is a park, which is important too in this study, um, and a historic property like the bridge unless you have no alternative. And you have to make that case as to why you can't avoid the bridge or a park or any of those sorts of things. Um, you have to consider what's the option of doing nothing, and you have to think about rehabilitation or building in a new location without affecting it, thus the parallel bridges uh, next to the existing structure um, that we were given as an option. And then you have to select the alternative that does the less, least harm to the property. Um, now this doesn't keep National Register properties from being affected, you just have to go through a lot more process and steps to demonstrate why you have to affect it. Um, so the, the process can take a year or longer usually to get through the DOT. Did I miss a slide? No. Okay. okay you're good. I, I want to clarify though that on the, uh, on the federal funding side as well, on the federal funding side there's also the NEPA process which would parallel likely the Section 4F analysis. So they would be done as a National Environmental Policy Act, likely an environmental assessment that would parallel 4F. Altogether, we're probably talking about at least two years of effort there of environmental planning work on, the, on this if, you go, if we go federal funding on the, on the um, to either rehab um, or uh, if the rehab is an adverse effect and definitely for removal. So just wanted to make that clear. Um, the U.S. Department of Transportation has been coming out with some special appropriations. Last year they did. Um, we didn't manage to, to get any of that money for this bridge, in part because there's all this environmental planning work that needs to be done. That, and we're almost in a catch-22 with this project because we don't have federal money, so how can we engage in the federal process? And we're not, we can't engage in the federal process because we don't have federal money. So it was kind of a catch-22, but um, we want to be able to, if that money comes available and the council decides that this, that the proposed future of this crossing is a bridge, either rehabbed or new, we want to be positioned to uh, take advantage of federal funding, and I would think if we could. Um, again, that all depends on the prioritization as it relates to timing of replacement or rehab and, and your decision there as to how fast you want it to happen. Because if the council, does, the city decides that this is gonna happen soon and we're gonna replace this bridge, probably not gonna go the federal, federal route because that isn't gonna be fast. So um, there's build dollars out there. I just completed two build grants with a couple different engineering firms here for this last funding round. Um, not that dissimilar from the Tiger grant that you guys have, um, which is consider considerable amount of grant money. Um, the, and there's other funding sources out there too, the STBG um, and the, the SWAP bridge program, which keeps you out of um, using state monies instead of the federals, keeps you out of some of the environmental processes like National Environmental Policy Act and Section 4F, but won't keep you out of Section 106 because our state DOT 
still require swap projects to go through that process. Correct? <laughs> okay. So, um, just some clarification of what we have in front of us and how our, you know, the, the procedural process as it relates to the decision at hand. Reuse considerations. Um, this is really interesting. So, if we decide, if the city decides to remove this bridge, tear it down, replace it with a new one, one of the mitigation measures might be to take a span. There's a nine, uh, there is a couple 60 foot spans, 90 foot span, what, Nick, two 90 foot spans? Just one. Yeah. Anyway, there's some different size spans to this structure that could be used elsewhere and serve as a mitigation um, to removing that structure. And there's a couple locations um, within nearby where that bridge could be used in Grapeville Park. Um, and Jesse, the city engineer, helped identify some of these locations. There would be cost for that mitigation because even the span would have to be rehabbed, but it could re be rehabbed on, um, instead of, you know, 50 feet up in the air, be rehabbed at ground level, right? Mm -hmm. And we would just be rehabbing a span that would be placed on a couple of abutments. Um, and that would be it. But it could be a great rehab project and preserve some of that history of Burlington and enhance a, a, the trail system in those parks by um, going over some of the, the steeper areas, the steeper uh, ravines in the park system. Um, so anyway, we did take a, a look at that. That is in the report, draft report that you have as well. Um, <clears throat> We also looked at, excuse me, use it using sections of the bridge outside of the community. Does someone, could someone else use the bridge? A county conservation group. Um, possibly, there was some interest in that. There was some interest in Buchanan County. Uh, this county engineer in Buchanan County is very into bridges and rehab um, and had, had some interest through Buchanan County Conservation. So there may be a, a use for that bridge elsewhere too as part of mitigation. Uh, I can't rule it out, um, but it, it would be, again, expense, logistics and et cetera would, would be some money associated with that mitigation. Um, you could utilize, utilize the steel bridge to fabricate a monument or structure. There's a lot of steel in that bridge, a lot of old steel. Um, how else? So my, my point in bringing these up, part of our, 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 was to look at some of these things in anticipation that <clears throat> if there was a decision to remove it, these are things you might want to think about as far as mitigation. And if we have federal money, these aren't things that we would have to think about. These would be things we would have to make a decision on and put in a memorandum of agreement with our historic preservation office and then agree to follow through on them as a mitigation to adverse effect. So again, get, getting a little bit into procedural process there, but um, some things to think about. Um, <clears throat> path forward. What, what, what I think the community needs to think about is obviously the economic or financial aspects of this decision, the social or community aspects, and the environmental. <clears throat> the environmental seems pretty straightforward. We've got a National Historic Preservation, uh, National Historic Preservation structure here. Um, how do we preserve that, the value of that? Um, it's already been well documented, both in terms of a historic American American Engineering Review, um, and through its nomination process. Um, so how, how best can we accommodate that as a important aspect of Burlington's past? Could we, could we, could we leave it in place somehow? Um, social community, the, the, you know, how does um, the ravine improve or distract from quality of life? a bridge over the ravine, ravine improve or distract from quality of life? How does connectivity of our transportation system, of our biking system, our pedestrian walkway system improve quality of life here in Burlington? So again, think about that when you're thinking about the social or community aspect. Um, you know, what are emergency access implications? Jim brought up, you know, that if we rehab it, eh, well, we're not, it's, it, it'll help. We can get an ambulance across for it during our major events that we hold over there in the park, 
but <clears throat> um, other than that it's not going to be much good for large fire trucks um, economic um, would seem self-evident implications of investment in the existing or new crossing um, what does that mean um, how much is your tax levy rate going to change if you invest in a new crossing here if we put in five million dollars if we rehab it for and and do mitigation and it amounts to ten million dollars what does that do to our levy rate um, and this is Jim's forte of, of which we did contact um, the city's financial advisor on this um, and I had a slide in here did you run through that one maybe it's coming up here um, so <clears throat> Some other considerations, um, there's no data that suggests the bridge is going to collapse right now. This bridge is a type of bridge that is vulnerable to if one section fails, the rest fails because of how it's engineered. But um, there's been no evidence that it's going to collapse under its own weight. Um, the federal funding process, as we've stated, I've got them all listed there as to what might be involved. It's going to extend your decision time frame. And if you go the federal route, you don't have a decision. You have a proposed action. It's not a decision until you get through the environmental process when you go the federal funding route. Because you're going to be continuing through that process, documenting how you're looking at alternatives. That's what the feds are going to require. Um, a decision not to pursue federal funding will decrease the time frame of the proposed action implementation re regarding the ravine crossing, regardless of whether that proposed action is removal, rehab, or replacement. Meaning, if you want to get this underway and get it done, you're not going to go the federal route. It's, it'll significantly reduce your time frame. You can get it done if you want to just do a general obligation bond to complete a new bridge at this location. So, like what time frame have you had to estimate? If Before you go the federal route, because we want to expedite things. You're going to have to prioritize it internally here in the city and get it budgeted, and you're going to have to do the bonding. I mean, how, how fast did you do Mount Pleasant, Nick, in terms of years worth of construction? Uh-huh. Physical construction. No, so yeah, a year of construction. Plan design, so it was a two-year process. Two years by the time it was built, but a year of upfront planning and processing and getting the, the funding in place. Okay. So engineering design, bid letting, et cetera. So, so you would still be talking about, if you made the decision today that, we're, hey, we're not going to pursue federal funding, we're going to fund this with city funds, and we're going to build a new bridge there, um, <clears throat> you're, you're still talking a couple years out. And federal funds add another two, three, four? Add another two, three, for sure. Four. Yes. <laughs> for sure. And this, this, this question came, uh, uh, <clears throat> someone brought this question up, I think it was at the public meeting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, there was concern about timing. So timing, timing seems relevant to the community. Um, maybe that's in part because we haven't been, been able to do anything with this thus far because of a lot of other priorities, competing priorities. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind. Um, I did have, and I'm going to just, is it? It's right before the cabinet. Okay, thanks. Oh. Here, I don't know how I missed this, but um, so this looks at what how your levy rate might change if you chose to fund this, um, and this came from Piper Sandler. Um, now they did say that if we, and I don't understand the ins and outs of this, but if we took it and we consolidated it with the rest of CIP debt, yeah, the there would be less of an impact on the levy rate. So as you look through here, the, they showed, and this is in the booklet, and for those who want to look online and the council packet, it's in the report that's in there, the same information. Uh, five, five million dollar and 10 million were the ones that uh, Piper, Piper Sandler put together for us, looking at 20 year debt. They did an estimated the 3% rate. Um, what that meant levy-wise currently uh, with our current valuation, 38 cents per thousand for the $5 million uh, project size 
77 cents per thousand for a 10 million project size. And that's as much as anything to give you some comparisons and think through those. It, as he talks about in the bottom part of this slide, um, I mean, here he's showing 15 to 20 cents per, for the 5 million and 40 to 45 cents for the 10 million. And part of what he's doing is taking a look at where this fits within our overall debt structure. Uh, with our existing debt, what our CIP, what we're looking at for projects coming on over the next few years, and where you can fit this into that CIP with our existing levies. Um, we were, we're in a position where we're able to have our levy come down uh, 40 cents here in a few, in a three, four years potentially. Uh, so he's figuring those kind of things in as he's, as when, when Travis was putting that slide together, that those are some things that put uh, your simple look at on the top part is just flat out what our current levies would be but then you're incorporating into a lot of more moving parts in that bottom one so the, bottom's a net, more the bottom is more of a net uh, impact on the overall levies um, and it also doesn't take into account everything uh, for example i mean this was pre-covid when we had uh, finances coming in to pay for our existing debt on uh, the flood levy project. And that funding source for this year was cut in half and next year is gone. And the makeup for that is out of debt service. So you know, you got a lot of moving parts when you try to look at what your net cost of it is. So with, with that, um, hopefully that gives you an overview of kind of the process here. And again, much more details in the hard copy, so feel free to you know, take a good look at that and, and provide any comments back to us on that. Um, you know, I think this has been a great process. Uh, I think the, the majority of the community that we talked to, they were, they were thankful that they had information coming out to them that they could see that how things were being considered. Um, they had data that they could get their hands on uh, relative to their own understanding of the engineering reviews on this. I mean, all those studies were made available on the website too. So I, I think overall uh, it was a positive process. Um, there is um, obviously in, in, in every community there there is a strong um, contingent that would like to save this, that are emotionally attached to this structure. Um, it's an old structure, and for those that live near it, it's been part of their lives for a long time. Um, you know, people sent us wedding pictures of, that were taken out on the bridge, et cetera. So, I mean, th there is some emotional attachment to this for some individuals in this community. So, not to be ignored. Um, so with that, you know, if there's any questions on our process, what, what we did, or what, you, you know, on the decision-making process, again, you know, what I see this is, is information that helps you, I hope, make what, what I would consider, consider a, a good decision for future generations, right? Because they're the mm -hmm. ones that are going to bear correct. the brunt of the financial. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are going to benefit the social benefit. Yeah, we will, but, but in all honesty, this thing's going to be around for decades, depending on what your decision, decision is today. So future generations are really going to either benefit from this or if we put nothing there at all and take it down, you know, that's, they're living with that as well. But they're also living with probably less of a financial burden in the community. So um, that's kind of what I have for you today, but happy to take questions. I heard your, your presentation when you came to the Young Leaders Seminar, but that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Is there any value in, in reusing the structure? Is there any resale? Do we get anything out of that steel? The, the demo cost assumed that there'd be salvage rights to the contractor, okay. and the demo cost still ended up at 200 and some thousand, I think is what, what it was. Otherwise, that cost would be somewhere probably around a million. It, it would be my, I, no, I don't think I'm quite a million, but it would definitely be probably double. Okay. So, yes, significantly higher. Um, now, the price of steel has also gone to crap. Okay. Pardon the expression. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it's really gone down in the last, you know, six months. 
Um, so, so again, timing, timing would matter okay. as to what that demo cost ends up being. Um, but that's a good question. This was just a question out of my personal curiosity here on the local economic effect uh, on the slide that had the cabin on it. Yeah. It, um, the, the 2014 Iowa Mississippi Parkway Commission statewide survey said the visitors consider the historical sites and museums the fourth leading factor. Mm -hmm. What were the first three? Uh, just out of curiosity, if you have any idea. Brandon, do you want to take that? Uh, give me a second. And why he's doing that, I, I just want your opinion on this. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people that you spoke to and, and took the survey agree that we do need a bridge, but not everyone agrees that it has to be a, a rehabilitated bridge. Correct. Okay. There was the, if you look at those pie charts, one of them shows um, overwhelmingly, well, even look at the bar chart shows overwhelmingly the alternative for a vehicle and new vehicle and pedestrian bridge. 70%. So, right. so the difference in opinion really is just between the people that would like a rehabilitated bridge and people that just want a bridge. Yep. So like, I think not just steering the conversation to what the, the real issue is behind this. Um, what was the, the three? So, the reason they choose it is for scenery and scenic views, feeling of safety, quality of roadway, signage, maps, and historical sites, in that order. And when they're interested in um, traveling, historical areas, scenic byways, national and state parks, and museums. Are there. Okay. So it's kind of too... A lot of it's scenery. I yeah. mean, ranking high well, up there. Yeah, and, yeah. and this is part of the scenery. If you, you, if you have that view of the road, pretty much the whole yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions, guys? Just to summarize, I want to make sure I understand this correctly because I know we've got another group coming in front of us in a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, so, roughly 70% of people said they wanted a pedestrian and vehicular crossing bridge. And, and I'm, well, I'm basically adding most important and important together when I look at that. Yes. That's um, correct. Roughly 66% of people said that they want a bridge, but they don't want to increase taxes for that. That makes sense. <laughs> and 70% said that if we were to do anything, that they would prefer a new bridge versus a rehabilitation. So we want a bridge, we want a new bridge, but we don't want to, we don't want to raise taxes to pay for the bridge. That sounds like every city government. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I summarized you, it correctly. You are. So, um, <coughs> so it's important to ask a variety of questions in this survey. It is. And that's what we did. And I think so the, the plan of this council has been and still is, unless it's changed without my knowledge, is to, to, to act on the bridge but act when it's financially feasible for the city. Um, yeah. Correct? Yep. So. Those answers fit within that plan. Within I'm that just plan. wanted to make sure that I summarized it correctly based off of the information you gave us. Correct. Yep. And if you don't want to pay more in taxes, then we're going to probably choose the most cost efficient option for those of you listening. Um, we're, we're going to go with the route that's going to save you all your money on your tax burden there. Right? And if you want us to, if, if you, you want, want us to have it. Uncle Sam help pay for it, it's going to take longer to get that done. Yeah. Right. It will be an involved process with this structure, not just this structure, but we've got some other environmental attributes to, uh, beneath the structure that right. will have to be sure. considered. So, well, and one of the most glaring statistics that kind of got brushed over that I saw in the whole thing, and I had seen it a while back, but the lifespan between a new bridge and a rehabilitation is 50 years, which means, and I have three little kids, which means that within their lifetime they will have to face the same problem that we're facing today if we choose the rehabilitation, and so, which I wouldn't be willing to support and then maintenance costs too, right? as a result of that. Maintenance is about maintenance the same I saw, depending on... There's, now, realize with an inspection comes maintenance. And yeah. so realize they were just repairing... So I, have, uh, my, I was up in northeast Iowa and this last weekend, and they were repairing the Lansing Bridge, which has the same graded type deck on it, right? It's a right. singing bridge up in Lansing, Iowa, right? And they got in there to do 
maintenance as a result of an inspection and as a result of the maintenance they were doing they found a lot more maintenance in the bridge and yeah. being closed for two more weeks well, so it, it's like with anything you, you buy an old Ford, right. Ford truck guess what you buy it and you anything you, you know the transmissions out replace the transmission fine we're good right no the next week the heater core goes out and I'm not saying that it's an identical analogy right. but with something old and with something that's corroded and aged and um, there's factors in there that are going to probably affect that maintenance cost more than what obviously more well, than what a new 50 bridge years was. from now the council is going to sit here and say that the council 50 years ago had the ability to replace the bridge for less than it cost to rehab the bridge for twice the lifespan and they'd probably be yeah. happy with it and, so and <laughs> you you keep in mind though as a decision you you can look at the alternative of a parallel bridge and, and maintain that structure, but you're still going to have to put some money into keeping that thing yeah, from falling down. I, you know, uh, I'm probably one of the few that's still in this that's in this building and still has a piece of the old MacArthur Bridge, which was a singing bridge. Oh. I have it in my house. I fondly remember that bridge, but I sure don't miss it because the new bridge is so much easier and so much better and less maintenance. So, uh, I, you know, I. I know that's not going to make the people that want re rehabilitation happy, but I'm think Matt echoed us. You know what the general gist of this council is: is we want to, we would like to replace it, like to replace it with new one. At least I would, but I also want to do it when it makes sense for us financially. And unfortunately, with the curveball that was thrown to us this year, that could that could put us a little bit of a whammy. But. Okay. Well, I'm I'm hopeful that you know. I, you know, the, I, I, I'm pretty. I'm, I'm confident the community considers the council, the city's effort to get this informa information out and to solicit it, it, it put was was good and valid um, and helpful. Um, and I hopeful, hope, hopefully, this information will help you make a, a decision that is right for the long term for the community. No, I, I would agree with you on that, Mike and Brandon. I, you know, I think I think the thing that we're that's always a hammer against any government is that. Well, we didn't have an opinion. We didn't have input. And your your work here, except especially especially the the report that's in the pamphlet, right. shows that they were given people were given every opportunity to comment and give input. And we're taking that comment and input uh, under advisement. So thank you for that. It's I feel that's a job well done. Thank so. you. Thank you very much. So. I had one more quick question. Sure. I thought of. Yeah. I know that this bridge is is really unique. There's not many left in the United States. Any idea how many are left? Of this particular type, this is the only one I've seen. There were yeah. what? Someone gave us a statistic. One or two. There was only about. There was only three or four reverse span bridges built, and and there was only two I think remaining. One that was in operation. That was. It's that some it's data very out a while back? very few. Yeah, Sam, I'm thinking I hadn't really explored the option of the parallel, but because of its uniqueness and it may be the only one left in the United States, that option does intrigue me. Okay. Yeah, and it, and it should. Again, I mean, you know, you also, it's very hard to do, but think 100 years from now um, and... We say Burlington, the what, only one of these structures you, in the world. What if you had to drop by and look at it? The only structure in the world that was... That oh, engineered this way and is still there. And I'm not trying to, to, to dissuade you one way or the other of this. Yeah. I'm here to be objective. I'm just saying that these are the things you need to think about is that in the future, what is the value of that historic resource? Whether it's a bridge, whether it's a downtown building, <clears throat> whatever it's gone, it might be. they're gone. Once yeah. they're gone, they're gone. Once they're, they're gone, they're gone. gone. They're gone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, we can preserve it, preserve the information, preserve the data, preserve what it looked like. <clears throat> some reuse it in some spots. Yeah. yeah. And Jesse had some good ideas for reusing it. So. Um, it was it was really intriguing. When it came to the pedestrian or the parallel bridge, we've seen it done across Iowa. And other mm -hmm. I've bridges. seen it done. Yeah. Um, it's pretty unpopular. The people that responded to the questionnaire maybe they didn't understand it. I don't exactly. think they quite understand it. Um, but when it came to the reuse thing, the bridge is associated with the park, and Jesse's idea was to use parts of it in the park. Yeah. And your respondent data was heavily.
So I know we've got the log cabin out there, and I have a vision that we can move a little one-room schoolhouse out there. I mean, I have a, this long-term vision <laughs> for our park. And then if we had the historic bridge, they well, would come. Especially over a ravine that, one of the ravines that Jesse had it over, Nick, I think, was overlooked the Mississippi River still. And it would be the south and east of the could we turn it into a bike rack for buses? That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. All right. All right. Nice try. All right. Thank you very much. Thank Jim. you. Any, anybody have any more questions? Jim, go ahead. Uh, I guess one thing here, as far as the report that came up tonight and the work that we've been working with Impact 17 on, uh, as we move forward, uh, there's a lot of decisions mm -hmm. at some point that are going to have to be made at, at this end from the the council's perspective. From the work that you've done, do you still have other steps to complete or to, that, to move forward with prior to the point where the council is make, making that decision? The, the council's, if you want to come up. And good, good point, Jim. The, the council's decision at this point, I would recommend that the decision is a proposed action, meaning um, we don't have any additional steps at this point until there's a proposed course of action. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but part of this study was to check a box in the delisting process, correct? We which we should already be going no. through. No. This is all of this is making sure that we are uh, treating a structure that is on a national historic register in an appropriate manner, making sure that we are going through all the options, uh, making sure that we cover all the bases and the that are out there. Is, is aware and, of this decision process and the mm -hmm. public is involved in it. And it's, it's so that, you know, if we choose to go the Section 106 route, the federal route with federal funding, that we haven't violated or foreclosed on any of the process in, in some of this preliminary work or preliminary decision making. If you foreclose or, you know, you've, you've let's say we, let's say, well, we, we don't know what we're going to do right now, so we're just going to, we're going to remove it. And, and then two years from now, some federal funding comes up, it allows you to build a new bridge there. Well, guess what? The, the DOT or Federal Highway Administration or the SHPO might say, um, that was a segmented decision process of which they're connected actions and, oh, by the way, we're not gonna grant the federal funding. Yeah. So there's some things here that are happening and put in place because of a process and we don't know which way we're going. When the council decides which way we're going, Jim's comment is, is there additional things we, can, we will need to do? Yes, we're, we're gonna have to engage. If, if, we go at, if we decide to go after a grant, a large grant, like order of magnitude millions of dollars grant, <clears throat> then we've got, yes, we have additional things to do. Okay. So, but Jim, as far as right now goes, as far as our process, there's nothing else we can do. Outside of the final report. Right. So we can't decide what until we know when, right? What's that? Is that right, Jim? You can't decide what? We can't decide what we're going to do until we know when we're going to be able to do it, right? Uh, you have to, I mean, you're getting another presentation coming to you in a month, for one, uh, with, with a group that's very impassioned around the idea of, of saving the bridge. Uh, and you have to as a group come up with what is, what's, what's your order of priority? Um, and you may have some different levels of priority. For example, you may have, if you know that you have federal funding to do whatever route you wanna do, it may give you more flexibility to decide to do it than if you don't have federal funding to do whatever you want to do. Uh, you may find that you have federal funding that's available for one route, but maybe not for another, another route. route. So your directions may be, may be derived by other things that are outside of what your purview is right now, but, but back, to, back to this point on timing, you know, if the city decides that within three years we want to, we want to cross you there, yeah. you've so, got decisions to make now. Yeah, and you have to, some of those, outside, outside federal funding. some of those decisions are going to be, where do we fit this into the CIP? Mm -hmm. uh, do you, are you making this a priority where you're saying we want to do everything that's on our CIP and add this and also be cognizant of the fact that you may be covering extra debt service for past projects? Um, 
or do you want to look at reprioritizing some of those projects out to get this in and maybe extending the years where some of those others go? And so I think that's something that in the immediate future, I would say you're probably having this input be a part of your process as we put forward the CIP this next year, right. if that Mike, makes sense. Mike, you said something about, um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but we start talking about large grants. Mm -hmm. We're looking more probably at the rehab than we are at the new construction, right? I mean, there's probably more forceful dollars behind the rehabilitation of historic preservation mm, sites than there is the... That. No, I would no? say I'd say okay. probably the opposite. Now okay. I can see I can see why you'd say that because you know as 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 a you know federal dollars with DOT and federal highways, you think they'd have a strong interest in, in saving some of these valuable structures. Feels like most programs are designed that way to preserve things instead of replace them. <laughs> right, but but no, I, the case of, and, and and the case right now with a lot of the money, it's build grants similar to your Tiger grant. And you apply for these grants, so you got a, maybe you got a one in ten shot of getting it, but it's significant money. It's also Required that you complete it within a very um, expedited time frame, if mm -hmm. you will. So, so this knowing some of the stuff and some of the information in front of you will help you make those decisions as to whether even to go after a build grant. Sure. Do we do we do we work with our regional planning agency to even submit an application? Okay. So, and, and that may come back to your timing. How how fast do you, how in prioritization? How fast do you want it? Yesterday. <laughs> Well, I think, I think the council could probably come up with a decision as to what we want to do in the next six months, but when we can do it is what we don't know, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, we're, yeah. Let, well, let's, uh, let's hear out the other group, and then we also have a vision, uh, vision plan coming forward, so I'm sure this will be part of that discussion as well. So we'll go from there. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions on the data or the data in the report. Feel free to reach out directly. Happy to, to answer those questions. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, just talking with Nick. Uh, in terms that you do, you have a draft report in front of you. Um, after presentation, where we're at, where are we looking at for a final report? I would like to give council some, you know, three weeks or a month. To digest that. So on a future meeting, we're, we'll be looking at having a resolution adopting the final report. Okay. Uh, it's ex sort of accepting it in, in its final form. It yeah. won't be major changes. I think you're going to see some of those typos changed. Right. And, so the typos, I saw four typos that I'd like to change. So. Yeah. And, 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 and if there's a question about clarification, I would like to clarify if it needs clarifying. Again, the whole goal of this is for the city and, and even the public to understand the decision at hand and the factors that go into that decision. And the idea of a resolution or accepting the final version mm -hmm. of the report, that's not saying you're moving in one route it's or another. Accepting it's accepting the, the information. Yeah. Got it. All right. No more discussion on that part. Then we'll go on to the last thing on our discussion items, appointments. It looks like uh, low rent housing has an opening. Uh, commission member Dick Millinger uh, has resigned due to health reasons. We thank you very much, Richard, for your service to the community. Uh, Mike Mertens has expressed an interest in serving on this committee, and it is re requested that the council review his attached application that's in the packet and consider appointing him uh, to the new two-year term, which will expire 7-6-2022. So we'll consider that on Monday as well. Is there anything else staff has? Eric, Don, Chief, Chief? I don't know. I, I'm just saying, you know, Chief. I'm a little bit, little bit disappointed for you that the fire department really kicked your tail on fundraising for God's Portion Day. So I had to get that in so Matt didn't boast later for you, Chief. But you thank you. One. You got to give him one. Got to give him one. Got to give him one. All right, Nick. <laughs> um, I just wanted to update you as of Monday, uh, the Central Street HMA project. Uh, should start uh, you'll start to see traffic control go into place we because we have a lot of abutting uh, property owners there we're, we're putting a letter together to talk about the time frame in which uh, the processes will start we're also sending a map we'll probably we'll put this on our web page as well but okay. phase one will be between angular and south uh, to try and avoid some of that double conflict with the locust street job um, so they'll go in and they'll put signage up we do have some businesses along there. That's kind of my biggest concern. I think there's like a daycare 
uh, that would see kind of daily traffic from, you know, not residents uh, to let them know. Um, but we'll be sending these out here probably tomorrow or Wednesday. So there it's are good to see that start. That project there are a lot of people excited about that project. I've, I, I've I know got that road's a lot in pretty, of phone pretty calls bad shape. It. Yeah, they're they're happy about that. So, thank you, Chief. We're accepting applications. All right, that is that is correct. We are accepting applications. Talk about that process because that's changed somewhat, right? Yeah, we probably ought to talk about that. Real quick, I just want to say you look probably ten years younger without the mustache. That's what everybody says. Yeah. I, there was something different. I actually just messed it up when I was trimming it, and I thought, now I'll just shave. I can't fix it now, so. <laughs> I kept staring at it. I was trying to figure it out. I didn't recognize I it have start with. I can't I remember the last time I have, didn't have a mustache. But. Anyway, we, we are accepting applications and resumes for firefighter, and we did change that, paramedic firefighter, we changed that process a couple weeks ago. Um, for testing, anyway, you don't have to have any EMS certification. So basically, high school diploma or GED, and you can apply. For the fire department, you still have to be a paramedic within three years of hire. So yeah, there still is that job requirement. Um, you have to pass our physical agility uh, testing first after you submit your application. And once you pass that, you'll do an online written examination. And then we do interviews on top of that. So it's kind of a three-part process to make the list so as as far as the ems certification you help them get there yeah okay yep we'll help them get there same with the firefighter training so okay how many positions do you have coming open chief we have three that'll be mm -hmm. open for sure in august so okay all right we'll, we'll make sure to get it out there thanks jim stephanie you have anything no jim you're up yeah, I did want to make sure he talked a little bit about that because I, I do feel good about getting a, a process that allows a, a much broader spectrum of folks to at least look at look at this option as, as a career. Um, I'll, I'll be gone this next week on vacation, so Nick will be filling in. He's pretty excited about it. <laughs> he's, been, he's been asking me about it for the last year. When, when's the next time you're going to be gone? Um, I have the radio this this Wednesday, so that means next Wednesday, y'all need to figure out who's yeah, going to be we'll on. we'll figure it out. I know you pointed at me. Thanks, Jim. One of the funding sources that I didn't mention earlier, uh, road use tax. Uh, we got some at least tentative guidance, and I know this will change as time moves forward. Uh, but where the DOT is looking at right now, what they're projecting for this next year, uh, the first four months of the fiscal year, July 1 through October, uh, they're looking at about a 20% reduction over what would have otherwise come to cities. Uh, our, our major funding streams are from uh, fuel tax collections and with driving still down and, and vehicle purchases. Vehicle purchases are down. Uh, they uh, have estimated that the following eight months of the fiscal year, about a 10% reduction year over year. So they're looking to average over the full year's time about a 13 to 14 percent reduction in road use tax funding. That for us is about $475,000. Now we have cash balance to absorb that, but that is a huge hit. And if, depending on, we don't know when that's coming back or how long. If you look at most of the scenarios for the economy as a whole, you see uh, what the economy's upward trend was on prior. Uh, to COVID and what their projections are now to get back to a, a, a lot of the projections are showing getting back to even uh, a year, year and a half down the road uh, and never, I don't see any of them they are saying we're catching up to the previous trend line. Mm -hmm. So those numbers won't be back where they were before. That will impact over a longer term period of time uh, what we, the, the total dollars that we have available for our capital projects. Um, we wrapped up legislative session this last uh, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, week and a half anyway, or no, just just over right out a week ago because they closed ago. up on Sunday night or Monday yeah. morning, something like that. Um, the nice thing about what came out of that from a city's perspective, backfill was not touched. Uh, but 
you also have to have an understanding as we go through this next year, uh, the legislature, when they approved the, the budget bill, left authority with the governor as we go through this next year. If revenue projections don't hit targets, she has, carte, she has essentially carte blanche authority to make uh, reductions in, in funding. I don't know what all areas that touches, but I'm pretty sure backfill is one of those items. Mm -hmm. um, it's the first time I've heard of legislature doing that. The last time we had a budget <clears throat> shortfall, the, we had a special legislative session in the fall to, to address that. So this is a different dynamic, and that means that uh, there are a lot of players out there that have funding coming in that need to be cognizant that that uh, what we are anticipating, we really kind of, it's dependent on how we, the economy comes back. Um, I think that's it. All right. I just wanted to make sure we had that. Thank those you. consequences thought of. Around the horn, Bill. I'm good. Robert. Uh, I would like to bring up that there's been a few bicycle accidents in Burlington. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone to be cautious when you're driving and to be safe when you're on a bicycle. And I, I don't like seeing that on the news or reading that, that someone got hurt or injured in an accident. So um, just be safe out there. Okay, Matt. Happy 4th of July. Linda. Some great bargains downtown. Go attack them. Uh, speaking of that, there is, a, there is a chance to help your city. There is a group uh, working with downtown and Roosevelt and throughout the community for a citywide sale July 10th and 12th. So spend your tax dollars here locally. Uh, forget Amazon. Don't even look that way. Spend your dollars here, and that would be helpful to the community. Uh, yeah, and then 4th of July, you know, it, I think we've all gotten calls about fireworks. Mm -hmm. Please, please refrain from shooting off fireworks to the big day. Let's have a, the, the, if you want to shoot them off on the 4th, I think we're all going to have to be tolerant of it. You're not supposed to shoot them off in town, and you're not supposed to shoot them off in West Burlington, anywhere close to a structure. So you might as well drive out to a county road and, and, and shoot them off out there. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, supervisor. Anyway, that's all I have. And if there's nothing else, let's adjourn. Thanks. Thank you.